Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to With the Prophet. I'm Ali Coleman. I'll be your host for the show. Thank you for being with us. We're looking at how to, we can make sure that as we live our lives as Muslims that we stay with the Prophet. That means following the Sunnah that he left behind for us to follow. In particular, we're looking at the relationships that he had with the people around him, interactions, and how we can uh, follow that example. Our guest is Sheikh Azam Al Hakim. Thank you for being with us from Saudi Arabia. Salam alaikum and welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and jazakumullah khair for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to a great discussion with you. Our subject today, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the grandchildren of the Prophet. Uh, peace be upon him. There were not many grandchildren, uh, only two very well known figures in Islamic history Hassan and Hussein. Uh, can we start by uh, confirming? Uh, that uh, very uh, unfortunate series of tragedies the Prophet endured regarding his children dying, burying uh, many of his children. And as a result of this, this is the reason that there's only two grandchildren that he uh, left behind. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi al-ameen, nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd, first of all, this is one of the misconceptions among the Muslims mm. that the Prophet ﷺ had only Al Hassan and Al Hussein okay. as grandchildren. Okay. He actually had more. So, from Fatima, who was his beloved daughter, and Ali, who was his cousin, he had Al Hassan, he had Al Hussein. He had Muhsin, and he had two, do two granddaughters, were Umm Kalthum and Zainab. Umm Kalthum was married to Umar ibn Khattab, who was way older than her and her father, yet he wanted to have a, a, a marital relationship with the descendant of the Prophet ﷺ. And Zainab was married to Abdullah ibn Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, uh, her cousin, if I'm not mistaken. Then the Prophet ﷺ had from his daughter Zainab bint Muhammad. He had Umama and he had Abdullah. So he, uh, Ali, that is. Umama, the daughter of Abu al-As, and Ali, the son of Abu al-As. And the Prophet had from Ruqayya, his daughter that was married to Uthman, one son, and his name was Abdullah, and he died when he was six years of age. So in total, these are the grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ. Well known of them is Al-Hassan, Al-Hussein, mm. Umm Kalthum for her marriage to Umar, and Umama for the hadiths where the Prophet ﷺ used to carry her and pray and lead the prayer while carrying her mm -hmm. and other hadiths as well. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and ju just to follow up, in terms of those grandchildren that survived, did they all survive? You uh, Meaning he didn't have to bury any of the grandchildren? He had mm. to bury some of them. I see. And there are authentic hadiths where, for example, uh, uh, the son of uh, Ruqayya and Uthman, mm. the Prophet ﷺ, buried some of his grandchildren and he was also in authentic hadith uh, um, he held one of his grandchildren while he was dying until he died mm -hmm. and he wept sallallahu alaihi and some of the companions even uh, uh, pointed this out to him and say you cry mm -hmm. this is a they sign were, of they were somehow shocked yeah a sign of weakness yeah. and the prophet said this is a sign of mercy. Mm. So men do cry yeah. because this is human nature. He was, Salo Salam was a real man. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk actually about mercy a little bit later. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, one part of um, Islam, uh, if we look at the Sunnah, we can learn a lot about uh, many aspects of life. One often neglected part is health and diet and healing. Um, I want to touch on both of these subjects, health and healing, and look at how uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, 
uh, demonstrated a concern for that and learned from the, these examples. We'll start with this uh, uh, tanik. Uh, so you have a newborn, an infant, a young person. They can't eat food that adults eat. What do can you what can you tell uh, tell us about this this tanik? Uh, uh, is it chewed or smashed uh, dates? Okay. First of all, when a child is born, there are a number of etiquettes mm. to be followed. Where do we get these etiquettes from? From the Prophet himself, And this is one of the benefits of studying the seerah, the biography of the Prophet that we tend to get deep into learning our religion through him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of the rituals or one of the etiquettes of receiving a newborn is that the first thing that enters a newborn's stomach would be a small, tiny piece of date. Mm. And this was proven through the authentic sunnah mm -hmm. when the Prophet was brought والسلام, with a child mm -hmm. to sort of bless him. And he took a small piece of date, he shooed it okay. quite well mm -hmm. so that it would not get stuck. Yeah. Rather, it would be uh, ob uh, absorbed totally by uh, uh, the child. And he put a small piece of it in the ceiling of his uh, uh, um, throat. Yeah. So just putting it there and the children by nature love sweet. So this newborn did not even taste his mother's milk That's yet. what I was going to ask you. That's, yeah. it's, it's the first thing. Mm. And the, in the hadith, it, it says that the prophet smiled when he saw that newborn liking what he is tasting. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. said, subhanallah, the people of Ansar love dates. And this was like a, a couple of hours old child. Mm. What's the benefit of it? As Muslims, we usually don't tend to relate things to medicine, to science, because it's an added value. But even if science did not prove anything, we adopt it because the Prophet did it, alayhi salatu wasalam. So scientists say that this helps immensely to fight the deficiency in glucose in the newborn's uh, uh, bloodstream. Mo modern science looking at the benefits of this practice that the Prophet Correct. conducted. Correct. Mm. So they say that this practice prevents the deficiency of glucose in the bloodstream of a newborn, mm. which means that it would help not in getting his muscles loosened or to get shortness of breath due to the deficiency of glucose and not to get his skin blue. These are things that modern science nowadays have proven. Mm. But again, we as Muslims rely entirely on the Sunnah of the Prophet I, I must say, Sheikh, I'm a bit envious of you because you're a Saudi national and some of the best dates are in Saudi Arabia. Here in Egypt, it's hard to get the high quality ones. My country, of course, the U.S. imports them and uh, I, I'm really missing those good dates. Inshallah, we'll send you a box of them. Don't Thank worry. you. Thank you. I look forward to it. I, we would like to move next to uh, this practice of Aikika. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that every boy is mortgaged by his uh, Aikika. So slaughter for him on the seventh day and shave his head and name him. Uh, would you please elaborate on... Uh, the prophet in this, Nonsense. in this, uh, he's saying every boy is mortgaged by Haikika. What does he mean by that? And what's the wisdom behind Haikika? I think this is a problem of translation. Okay. See, a lot of the times we have big issues when it comes to translating Arabic text into other languages. If the person translating it is not knowledgeable mm. in both languages, yeah. and at the same time is not knowledgeable in Islamic uh, studies, you have issues. I remember once I was doing um, a lecture on um, funeral rites, mm. and there was a hadith, and I was looking for the interpretation of it. 
The hadith states that there are seven people who are martyred or considered to be martyrs other than those killed on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of them in Arabic is al matun The word al matun has two meanings. One is a person who's stabbed. Uh, again? al matun mm -hmm. A person who was stabbed, stabbed with a knife. Okay. So it comes from a tan. Mm. And the other meaning, which is the right translation, is someone who is afflicted by the plague, who dies due to the plague, mm -hmm. the, the epidemic, the disease. Mm. So the interpreter of the hadith, who happens to be an imam in the US, on his website, said that one of the martyrs is the person who has been stabbed. Mm. And imagine someone reading this and saying, okay, I'm going to downtown LA and meet a, th a thug and have him stab me so that I'll be a martyr. This is the wrong interpretation, the wrong understanding. Likewise in this hadith, okay. the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, kullu ghulamin murtahinun bi'aqiqatih. Meaning that each and every newborn is pledged for, pledged. Mm, not, mean, mortgage. not mortgage. Not mortgage. Mortgage mm. is selling and, and buying houses through interest uh, mm. and, and banks loans. Right. But this is not what is meant. It means that this newborn is pledged, he's related to his aqiqa. What is aqiqa? Aqiqa is a sacrifice that a person offers whenever he is blessed with a newborn, mm. whether a boy or a girl with difference of the numbers pertaining to each one of them. And I don't know if we have time. We, we will go further uh, into Akika uh, Sheikh after our first break. We'll be back, inshallah, to continue our discussion. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. We'll continue our discussion about uh, Akika with uh, Sheikh Azam. Uh, please, uh, you started before the break to talk with us about Akika. Uh, please continue uh, with this. Um, one of the things that the Prophet instructed us to do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was to shave the head of the newborn. Did that apply to both male and female newborns? Okay, I think before we go to the shaving aspect, mm -hmm. um, before the break we wanted to talk about the meaning of being pledged. Yeah, that's, that's right, you're right. Let's do that. So what is the meaning of being pledged to or mm -hmm. uh, uh, connected or related to? This, the scholar said that whenever a person does not slaughter this sacrifice as a form of gratitude to Allah for blessing me with a child, then if the child were to die at an early age, mm -hmm. he would not intercede for, for his parents because his parents fell, fell uh, uh, short from uh, following mm -hmm. the sunnah of sacrifice. The other interpretation, as the scholars say, would be that those whom their parents do not offer the aqiqah, the sacrifice mm -hmm. for them, they will not protect their children from shaitan. So he would have some sort of influence over them as they grow up. As in the case when a person has intimacy with his wife and he does not say bismillah. If, he's, if he does and Allah Azza wa Jal decrees that from that night, uh, a, a child uh, uh, is resulted, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then if he does, Allah will protect that child from shaitan. If he doesn't, Allah will not. So it's almost the same thing mm. as the scholars um, uh, say to us. There are etiquettes for aqiqah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The age, for example, it's the same as the age of udhiyah. And udhiyah is a sacrifice we offer when we do not perform uh, Hajj, we offer it on the Eid of Hajj. So it has to be six uh, months old if it's a sheep, at least, or one year old if it's a goat. It can, uh, these are the principally the two animals. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the most authentic opinion is that you cannot slaughter uh, a, a camel or a cow and have seven shares like you do in Hajj. Ah. This is a different story, it's an issue of dispute, but this is the most authentic opinion. And also, 
when it comes to the number of sacrifice we have to give, it differs from if it's a male uh, uh, a child or a female child. Okay. And again, I can hear them saying, uh, uh, the, the women as usual coming and complaining and the, this is male chauvinism and, 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 and all the, this nonsense they have. This is Islam in the sense that we are to execute what Allah tells us to do. We have to perform what Allah orders us to do. In Islam, there are five incidents and cases where a male is double the female. One of them is the aqiqah. Okay. If you're blessed with a baby boy, mm -hmm. you slaughter two sheep. I see. If you're blessed with a girl, you, 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 you slaughter one sheep. Hmm. Okay. The second is when it comes to testimony. So Allah mentioned in the, at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, that the testimony of a man is equivalent to the testimony of two women. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I have a transaction, selling and buying loans and, and, and the likes, I have to have two male witnesses. Mm -hmm. If not, then one male witness and two female witnesses. Mm -hmm. So this is number two. Number three, it deals with blood money. So if a person by mistake kills a man, he has to give a hundred camels or what's worth of the value of a hundred camels mm. to his family. This is blood money. Okay. But if he kills a woman, he gives 50 camels. Mm. And I don't know, I've lost track. The fourth or the, or the fifth, I don't know, um, is when it comes to inheritance. So as mentioned in chapter four, Surah An-Nisa, Allah Azza wa Jal advises you about your offspring. لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ The child, male boy, has double the female girl in inheritance. Mm -hmm. So if I have mm -hmm. a, a son and a daughter, he gets two shares, she gets one share. And the last and fifth category where women are half of the men is in the reward of freeing a slave. Mm. The Prophet tells us, والسلام, if a man frees a slave, Allah will free with each organ of that man an organ of the one who freed his slave from hellfire. Mm -hmm. So this is a great virtue to freeing slaves and Islam promotes freeing slavery like uh, nothing else. Yeah, there's a spiritual incentive. Yeah, so if you mm -hmm. free a slave, with each organ of that slave, Allah frees an organ of you, an arm for an arm, mm -hmm. a leg mm -hmm. for a leg, mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. And then the Prophet says, and whoever frees two women slaves, Allah will free one of that person. Mm -hmm. So these are the five incidents. Yes, yes. And so it, it all started with Aikika and the uh, uh, animals have, uh, are, that are offered depending on male or female. So Correct. thank you for that accounting. accounting. Um, of course the meat has to be uh, uh, distributed but a lot of us may think that it has to be divided into three uh, uh, divisions. One for charity, one for gifts to the neighbors and loved ones, and one third we consume it, like the udhiyah. And this is not true. Mm. Aqiqah is different from udhiyah, that all what matters is the shedding of the blood as a form of gratitude for the sacrifice to Allah Azza wa mm. What to do with the meat, it's up to you, and the sky is the limit. You can put it all, store it in your fridge, you can give it all to the poor. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. invite your friends and loved ones and have a feast and eat it all. Mm -hmm. And you can divide it into different parts and uh, 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 distribute it here and there. So the social impact when the Prophet ﷺ performed Aikika for his grandchildren, um, 
can you, what do we have in our records about that, the social impact? How did it affect the people when the, they saw the prophet doing this, uh, peace be upon him, for his grandchildren? Actually, it's not only for his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. This is an Islamic practice for each and every individual to perform once he's blessed with a child. Now, is it mandatory or is it voluntary? It is highly recommended. Mm -hmm. But if someone does not perform it, especially when he does not have the financial means to do so, he's not sinful. Yet, let's assume that I grew up and discovered that my parents did not offer the aqiqah for me. Is there any harm for me to do it now, after all these years? Scholars say there's no problem in that. Mm. It is rewardable. What was the social impact? Imagine in Medina when it, they were poor and they did not have sufficient means and food. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ slaughtered the sheep and invited his friends and companions and loved ones, what impact that would leave on them. They would be happy. Yeah. They would make a lot of dua, mm. which we know that we have to do to the one who's blessed with a child in a certain uh, uh, format. And the poor, the needy, and those around you will benefit from it as well. Mm. Good. You touched a little bit on some of the guidelines or the, the rules, the principles governing Aikika. Just a, 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 another question about this, and um, um, you said that we could do with the meat whatever we chose, whether it be charity for our own consumption or giving to our friends or what have you. Uh, any other thing that is most important to think about, consider, if we want to do this for our children or, or grandchildren? Well, see, there is an etiquette, maybe I failed to mention that, mm which is that there is a time. A time frame? It's not a time frame, it is, it's a time recommendation. Okay. So the Prophet ordered us والسلام, to slaughter this aqiqah on the seventh day of the child's birth. Mm -hmm. And this means that if I were to exceed that limit, am I sinful? The answer is no, mm -hmm. because it's a sunnah. Mm -hmm. But some scholars say that it is best to have the multiplications of seven. So if you can't do it on the seventh day, do, do it on the 14th. I see. If not, mm. do it on the 21st. And if not, then the sky is the limit. One, one last quick question. We're out of time, but very quickly about charity. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu instructed his daughter Fatima to give the equivalent uh, weight of the, uh, her son Hussein's hair in the form of silver uh, for Correct. charity purposes. Why hair and what's the significance of that? The Prophet instructed us والسلام, when someone is blessed with a newborn child to name him on the seventh day, to slaughter the aqiqah on the seventh day and to shave his head. Mm -hmm. In another narration, he said, remove this filth. See, when a child comes out of his mother's womb, there are are a lot of things stuck to his skull, to his scalp. So by shaving the hair, mm -hmm. you ensure that the skin is fresh, it can breathe, it's clean. Even if you wash uh, the scalp with, with shampoos, it's not gonna help mm. because he's been there for too long. Mm. So shaving it gives the head a healthier uh, um, look and a better way of, of breathing. Part of showing your gratitude to Allah is to weigh this hair, which probably is like three grams, four grams, it's, it's peanuts. It's not even half a, half a dollar mm -hmm. or a dollar. Yeah. And you give it in charity. Mm. But do we do this for both boys and girls or only for boys? It's an issue of dispute. Mm. And I am inclined to the opinion that the filth is in both. Mm. heads mm -hmm. of a girl and a boy, so shaving them uh, uh, would be the right thing to do. Great. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for your answers, your time, your patience. We have reached the end of this episode. We hope to continue uh, with looking at how we can continue to be with the Prophet in our lives. Thank you very much. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.